Thank you all for uh, coming to this exciting conference on academic freedom and issues that many of us are faced with here every day on university campuses, but clearly also uh, in other parts of the world, the West Bank, uh, Mexico, the borders of Central America, to name only a few that are indeed interrelated, as David does suggest. Um, I uh, will make my introduction short because how do you summarize uh, years and years of activist struggle in so many different ways, uh, which is represented and has been done by the people who are on this impressive committee. Um, Sandra Hale has been active for decades in fighting for academic freedom, um, for taking that to places that uh, have been hotly contested, to say the least, and has published many books uh, in dealing with Africa and the Sudan, uh, women's rights, and certainly for issues surrounding freedom uh, for Palestinians um, in uh, the West Bank and in Palestine. Um, when I asked her what she wanted most to mention, and so I don't run over terribly, she said the life, full lifetime distinguished scholarship from the Association for Miss Middle Eastern Women's Studies and Sudan Studies, and from the Salman Women's Resolution Center of, of Khartoum, and for 50 years of support and commitment to the Sudanese women's movement. Um, Sandra is indeed an international figure in this, as well as organizer and coordinator of many organizations that are dealing with these issues of academic freedom. Well, as we heard yesterday, things are pretty bad in terms of what we can and can't say. But I went to graduate school in, in the 60s, uh, and my uh, partner was on the geography faculty at that time, and we couldn't even use the word Palestine. He got complaints from his students to straight to the dean for using the word Palestine in his geography of the Middle East class. I was called aside by the Orientalist uh, director of the Near East Center at that time, Gustav von Grunebaum, and uh, who attempted to intimidate me by telling me that by using Palestine I was only showing my ignorance of uh, Middle East history. Um, and that was a no-no, absolutely a no-no word. It's unbelievable today that it was a no-no word in the 60s, but it was. As a, uh, so there's quite a bit of, of history beyond what we were told um, yesterday. The, as a founding member, I'm now an endorser and not actually a member, but as a founding member of the U.S. Committee for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, and as the coordinator with Lisa Raffel of, um, for the last, well, in my case, for the last eight to nine years of California Scholars for Academic Freedom, I can briefly present some examples from my own experiences and from the experiences of academics at uh, the University of California with emphasis on UCLA and on the beleaguered status of faculty and students connected to Middle East studies and events at U on UC campuses and a bit beyond that. Uh, I won't be talking about Cal State because Manzar will be doing that, so I don't mean to exclude Cal State from the assaults and so on, but uh, that's the reason I won't be talking about Cal State. Although I, had, I taught at Cal State Long Beach, the same thing prevailed there. Um, and I taught at Cal State Northridge, the same thing prevailed there. Sometimes we were fortunate to have um, uh, very enlightened and politicized administrators. That was the case at Northridge, not at Long Beach. Um, and so it, you know, it, it varied, the atmosphere varied. Well, first of all, let me tell you about California Scholars for Academic Freedom because that's one of the things I was asked to talk about. Uh, we are a group of over 150 professors, probably close to 200, at uh, universities and colleges um, throughout California. Um, I formed the group uh, out of a group called the Right to Education for Palestinians. That's not the right title. I can't remember it right now. Um, I formed that, the group because of the various violations of academic freedom that were arising from both the post-9-11 
climate of civil rights violations and from the increasing attacks on progressive educators by neoconservatives. As we know, many of these attacks have been aimed at scholars of Arab, Muslim, or Middle Eastern descent, or at scholars researching and teaching about the Middle East and or Arab and Muslim communities. That takes in a fairly, it's a fairly broad category. Our goal of protecting California scholars, uh, based mainly in institutions of higher education, has grown broader in scope to include threats to academic freedom across the United States, and where revel, uh, relevant, yes, thinking of revolution, where uh, relevant um, globally as well. Now we recognize that violations of academic freedom uh, anywhere are threats to academic freedom everywhere. So we've bombarded officials and issued press releases and attempted to intervene in various other ways. How effective we've been, uh, it's always hard to measure these sorts of things, but we've made noise where it was necessary to make noise. It's a sad testimony that the vast majority of the academic uh, freedom cases that we've acted on have been related to Middle East studies. Um, or to uh, to faculty or to students, student activists such as uh, Palestinians for Justice in Palestine. I'm sorry, <laughs> students for Justice in Palestine, uh, and Palestinians for Justice in Palestine as well. Uh, we've worked on behalf of uh, such groups as the Irvine Eleven um, um, and and many other student groups. Now, Palestine, Israel, and human rights violations. Um, related to the occupied area have figured all too prominently in the work of our organization. We saw yesterday that from our Palestine legal speaker that uh, California is very, very prominent, has far more such cases than any other state in the United States. And I had asked the question in the Q&A, what, what is that about? Uh, I asked the question, you know, is that just the historical accident of Amcha being a part of, uh, you know, being based in California and a few other organizations that were named? Uh, or is it something deeper than that? Is there some demographic reason for that? Uh, is there a history of uh, anti-Semitism in California that's greater, say, than anti-Semitism elsewhere and thus the um, the reaction to that. I mean, why Why are we seeing, what's the touchiness about these issues? Uh, if anyone can answer that for me, I'd be very, very thankful. Uh, I said that we'd sent lots of letters and, and, and uh, dealt with pre uh, press releases and so on. In fact, one, one such letter was in June that we wrote to the chancellor of this university, Kim Wilcox, for failure to make a strong public defense of academic freedom in the case of the fully vetted um, student-run R course on Palestine uh, that was offered. Um, those of you who were here yesterday have already heard the story of that class, which actually did, it, she was able to teach it. It did prevail. Um, now, the groups that have attacked the course, including Amha uh, Initiative, and Accuracy in Academia, and the David Horowitz Freedom Center, and Stand With Us, um, are the same groups, plus a few others like Campus Watch and, and so-called Brandeis Center for Human Rights, uh, who have been violating or threatening the academic freedom of many University of California faculty and students and the public intellectuals among us. In fact, in the title of an article uh, that's in Arabic, actually, that I wrote in a journal published in Beirut, called um, Al-Adab, I make the point that politics, Palestine, and the U.S. Academy are integrally connected, but it's the subtitle of my article that's more significant to me. The subtitle is Public Intellectuals in Dark Times. That tells the story of a slightly different segment of the population among us, the people who write in newspapers or on the Internet, give public lectures, speak at rallies, give radio, TV, social media interviews, and those who speak out on Twitter and the like uh, about Palestine, Palestinians and the grave situation for their, their academic freedom and other freedoms, uh, Palestinians who are being especially targeted. These attacks may not technically fall under academic freedom, but many are academics and are threatened in all ways. 
What would the U.S. be like if we or they were silenced or even made reticent by the chilly atmosphere? At UCLA, we had one of our more famous cases of a public intellectual who uh, was also an academic speaking out outside the campus and being sacked. Um, that's when the regents fired Angela Davis. And uh, many people think it was the administrators who fired her, but in fact it was the regents. Um, she was, I mean, things got more complicated later, but initially the reason for her being fired was that she had made um, inappropriate political comments uh, off the campus. Um, that just seems unheard of today, and yet it isn't, because we know from the, the Steve Salida case that that's still a possibility. And we also know from what the regents seem to be, pl the University of California seem to be plotting now, that it's not um, beyond the realm of possibility that they can way overstep themselves, not only with, um, on campuses, but off campuses. And for me, this is especially, even though we're calling this conference on academic freedom and we're primarily concerned with academic freedom, I'm also concerned with the threat to public intellectuals um, who happen also to be academics. Uh, to add a bit more history, a little bit different from what we heard yesterday, over the last decade, uh, one especially uh, troubling condemnation of the call for an academic boycott um, was in the form of a 2007 full-page ad in the New York Times that we may all have f forgotten. It was signed by 57 Nobel laureates. Now, most of them were from the fields of economics, science, and medicine, where we might expect this, but they were also including uh, peace laureates, Mikhail Gorbachev, um, the Dalai Lama, uh, Eli Wiesel, Frederick de Klerk, South Africa, all Nobel Prize recipients, and even literature, um, the literature laureate Wale Soyanka, who should have known better. Um, they signed this full-page ad condemning the uh, the. Uh, suggestion, the the movement to academically boycott Israel. I wonder if they would do the same thing today. I doubt it very much. I think we have at least inched our way into the public consciousness of such people. Although there's a new wave of oppression, as we know. Throughout the country, an atmosphere of McCarthyism is pervasive on a number of campuses. I'm no stranger to teaching in institutions of higher education which are under academic freedom duress. I taught at the University of Khartoum in Sudan in the 1970s when the government and university were controlled by the military and still are. I'm sure that what I experienced was similar to what many Palestinian academics have had to encounter for many years. There was little freedom in the classrooms. Uh, progressive faculty had been sacked or put in prison. Syllabi had to be vetted by a committee. Books were closely scrutinized and banned, and the chancellor was a political appointment by the military government. Most notably, however, were the times when one had to pass a, a checkpoint, so to speak, to get in through the gates to go to one's office or to the library. I'll never forget when the army came onto campus to occupy it, nor forget having to pass through a university gate guarded by soldiers with machine guns. We in the U U.S. haven't reached that point yet, although Palestinians have. But I would contend that more than ever, this is a time for liberation pedagogy in our classrooms and on our roles as public intellectuals. The current crisis before us in higher education, which is so closely linked to the Middle East and to criticisms of Israel, is to a large measure a result of the U.S. government's uncritical support of Israel. We in the U.S. are living in a political atmosphere in which warrantless wiretapping and other forms of surveillance are, again, rampant and conveniently rationalized as protecting our country against terrorism. It's an atmosphere in which the U.S. has carried out two invasions, leaving two countries in ruin and civil war. It is a moral environment in which torture is being carried out with impunity, some of it sexual and in which the writ of habeas corpus might as well not exist. It's an atmosphere of growing hate language and internal terrorism against mosques, synagogues, churches. It's an atmosphere in which the onslaught on education is at all levels. Uh, from the censorship of high school teachers for criticisms of George Bush 
to attacks on Middle East Studies professors at Columbia, UC, and many other institutions, to a 2006 firing of a Roosevelt University in Chicago lecturer because of a statement made by a student in his class that Zionism is racism. What was the offense? The instructor did not silence the student. Are we to think from this case and others that the neoconservatives not only want to silence us professors, but also use us as tools to silence our students? Outside the academy, there are too many examples to list of canceled public lectures, art exhibits, and so on. I don't have time to go into all of that. But um, the 2000s have been quite a time for canceling um, various events. Uh, one of the more recent ones was the cancellation of a San Diego uh, concert by Marcel Khalifa. Again, these are often events that are linked to the Middle East, Palestine, or Muslims, or to cultural figures or scholars in the U.S. who've been known to be critical of Israel. Um, for example, the cancellation of a public lecture by Stephen Walt of Harvard and John Mershimer, sorry, of Chicago, by the Chicago Global Affairs Council. The two distinguished scholars are the authors of The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy. That was enough to have their the cause of furor. Such are the violations in a so-called free cultural or scholarly atmosphere. We all know about attempts and successes in censoring such uh, known critics of Israel as Norman Finkelstein and Noam Chomsky and others. And we all know about as I mentioned earlier, the cancellation of Stephen Salaita's job at the University of Illinois Champaign because of some of his polemical comments on Twitter. The serious infringements on a academic freedom in our educational institutions since 9-11 since caused the American Association of University P Professors, AAUP, to issue a 2003 report called Academic Freedom and National Security in a Time of Crisis. The AAUP has a spotty record itself. Um, but they did announce the formation of a special committee on academic freedom and national security. Can you let me know when I have five minutes? You're on two. <laughs> You're on three. You're on three. Okay. Huh. <laughs> well, what I wanted to tell you about, the, even though they've issued these statements about academic freedom, um, thanks to Kerry Nelson and some of the conservatives in AAUP, uh, they've done other things. One of the things was to cancel a conference in Bellagio, which was supposed to discuss the boycott in a very academic way. I was invited to that conference, all ready to go, and one week before the conference was to take place in Italy, it was canceled. Um, the funders, Ford, Rockefeller, and uh, Nathan Cummins, withdrew their funds and AAUP caved in, of course, they almost had to, but instead of trying to raise funds to have it another time, uh, they, uh, they never held it again. Um, well, I could go on and on. I, I wanted to tell you, because it may be forgotten already, but um, I want to tell you something about the UCLA experience. In January 2006, the UCLA campus was given a wake-up call in the form of a well-prepared direct neocon attack on our academic freedom. A right-wing website was circulated that was encouraged by Horowitz, although he claimed he later that he didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, but this um, was, was, um, website was well circulated. It profiled some 30 UCLA professors as radical and dangerous. Uh, initially, students were offered money to spy on their professors uh, and help the website manager compile more profiles. Supposedly, these dirty 30, as we were called, uh, professors were exposed as the perverted, radical, and liberal biased teachers that the right wing always thought us to be. I'm really proud that I was number six on that list <laughs> and that I was the top woman on the list. There was some sexism involved in the selection of the more radical <laughs> professors. Um, even the outgoing UCLA chancellor, not known for his liberal views, called the website reprehensible. Now, at the heart of this uh, criticisms of, the number, of, number, of a number of us was our support of Palestinians and their criticisms of Israel. Um, the Palestinian rights activism was referred to as virulent anti-Semitism. 
targeting Gabriel Peterberg, Sari Maktasi, whom you'll hear at the end of the day, and me. Actually, I was very offended because I was called the female version of Gabby Peterberg. And, I mean, talk about sexism rampant throughout all of these sorts of things. There are always these issues within issues. Um, I don't have time to um, go into much more, but what I wanted to, um, this group, I wanted to tell you about uh, a website that was set up by Scholars uh, for Peace in the Middle East by um, a colleague of mine. Um, I mean, to have, to be so directly attacked by a, a colleague is very difficult. But he attacks Susan Slimovich and me um, for postmodernism, postcolonial theories, and our support of, of, of Israel, I mean, our criticisms of Israel. I don't have time to develop that. Uh, well, let's see what I do have time to do. Nothing, Not it much. appears. <laughs> Not, <laughs> well, what I want to um, end with, and I have a lot more to say, but what I want to end with is this suggestion that, that Bashar Dumani makes, that maybe we'd better look at the concept of academic freedom again and see what we mean by it and see if it makes any sense in an atmosphere that the Palestinians live in, for example, or if it makes any sense in a country where the Patriot Act and the war on terrorism are reigning. Uh, just what, what do we do with a freedom called academic freedom in an atmosphere like that? So in addition to wanting to figure out what's underneath all the California stuff, I'd like us to think about that. Thank you. Um, Dr. Curtis Marez is at UCSD and was also the uh, head of the American Studies Association when it took on some of these issues in dealing with Israel. Um, and he also tellingly deals with issues regarding media technology in the lives of Mexican immigrants as well in that intersection that we know of. He's been the editor of American Quarterly uh, as well, and I'm very glad that you're part of this panel um, well, when I got the invitation uh, to come to uh, and, and deliver a talk here, uh, I was actually working at the Huntington Library and Botanical Gardens in this uh, weird wealthy enclave near um, uh, Pasadena in Southern California. Uh, and for those of you who don't, uh, who don't know, uh, the, the Huntington Library is sort of like a, a country club for scholars. It has a kind of amazing uh, uh, um, uh, co historical uh, collections uh, and literary collections, but also uh, this massive uh, estate uh, garden um, that uh, historically uh, was part of a, a robber baron uh, eugenics experiment, uh, both involving uh, 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 plants, uh, but also involving the racialized labor, the uh, Latino and Asian workers who worked on, um, uh, who worked in the gardens. Uh, uh, given UCR's uh, history of citrus research, I think that UCR is probably part of uh, this longer history that was uh, partly informing uh, my thinking about what I was going to say today. So while I'm working at the Huntington, I take a quick break to go to the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, or no, LA, Los Angeles Museum, LACMA. Let's just use the initials. Uh, county. Uh, and at that, uh, I went there to see a, a Noah Purefoy show, which is a Nor Noah Purefoy was a great uh, a black uh, artist who in large part reflected on uh, what it meant for black people to live in occupied uh, Los Angeles, uh, police-occupied uh, Los Angeles. So while I was there, though, uh, uh, I saw uh, this really striking uh, image on the screen by Tal Suhat. Um, it's a, a picture of, uh, of course, of an, of an almond tree. Um, and um, I discovered that this particular uh, uh, Israeli artist, he's, uh, he's from Israel, uh, has a whole series of, um, of photos of, of, uh, of different kinds of, of fruit or other kinds of trees. So I think it goes here uh, along the top. It's olives, uh, pomegranates, apples, uh, pears, dates, uh, and I think those are uh, oranges. 
uh, uh, there uh, at the end. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of uh, ghostly and striking to me. I mean, one of the odd things about them is the way in which uh, these trees appear wholly isolated and, and seemingly decontextualized uh, from any background, from any sort of larger agricultural space, and certainly uh, uh, from workers. Um, and so, you know, that in and of itself made them strange. But what made them even more strange is that this, uh, this Israeli artist's photograph was included in a show called uh, uh, Islamic Art now, uh, in what I can only assume was a kind of settler uh, curatorial uh, practice. Um, now, there's no direct connections that I've been able to determine, but it was also striking to me to discover that one of the most prominent uh, 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 philanthropists supporting LACMA uh, is this couple called um, Linda and Stuart Resnick, uh, who happen to be billionaire uh, almond farmers in the San Joaquin Valley of California as well as some of the most prominent uh, Zionist philanthropists in the U.S., in particular uh, uh, with large donations uh, uh, and influence in the, in the UC system. Uh, so the Resnex uh, will, will reappear uh, in, uh, in my talk. Um, so in a recent post on the AAUP's academic blog titled A Transnational Occupation, my new UCSD colleague, Kamala Viswaswaran, has concluded that her article there describes the impact of the occupation on higher education in the West Bank and Gaza. And I would highly recommend the article for, uh, for that. But Israel's, Israel's occupation of Palestine is a transnational one, and its effects are also felt in the U.S. Uh, Academy. Um, so uh, in that spirit, my talk today uh, is part of my attempt to think transnationally about how agribusiness interests in California impinge upon academic discussions of Israel-Palestine, particularly in the University of California. In my forthcoming book, Farmworker Futurism, I focus on the dominant role agribusiness has played in California state politics in general and in the, in the, in the administration of the University of California in particular, usually to the detriment of the farmworker movement. The United Farm Workers, for example, rightly argued that rather than centering on issues that mattered to working people, research in the UC system, especially at UC Davis, effectively subsidized agribusiness and the exploitation of farm workers. In recent years, agribusiness corporations have increasingly helped divert university research towards collaborative Israeli-California agricultural projects while correspondingly limiting debate of Israel-Palestine. My remarks today can thus be understood as part of a larger discussion of the basis for Chicano-Palestinian solidarity. Moreover, I conclude by suggesting the significance of a kind of Foucaultian turn in thinking about Zionist donors and academic freedom, a turn that foregrounds both efforts to silence criticisms of Israel and efforts to promote research that effectively legitimates occupation. About a year before uh, she condemned me and, and the ASA's boycott of Israeli academic institutions, UC Davis Chancellor Linda uh, Katehi, that's uh, also the, the pepper spray chancellor, we should remember, uh, led a delegation of over a dozen U.S. university presidents to tour Israeli universities, uh, where there she was quite happy to learn about new innovations uh, in drip irrigation that she could take back to Davis. Um, she also visited a vineyard on settlements in the Golan Heights, which she concluded was, quote, a testimony to Israeli agricultural technology. But, Katehi added, UC Davis could share that pride. I discovered that the wine master and several other people at the winery had actually studied at UC Davis. Of course, UC Davis has an, an acclaimed, globally acclaimed uh, winemaking and, and vintner uh, uh, program. Um, in fact, um, uh, indeed, uh, many prominent Israeli vintners are graduates of Davis's winemaking program. Without Davis, I think Israel's winemaking uh, industry would be, would be nowhere. Um, uh, in fact, the origins of Israel's modern wine industry are dated to 1972 when a UC Davis professor visited the occupied West Bank and suggested that parts of it were ideal uh, for growing wine grapes. As reported in the Electronic Intifada, Danny Dayan, former chairman of the Yesha uh, Council that lobbies for expanded West Bank settlements, owns a vineyard there called uh, uh, Shagat Winery 
named for the illegal settlement where it is located on Palestinian land that diverts water from nearby Palestinian villages. Uh, uh, Sagat's vintner, Josh Hexter, was trained at UC Davis. Hexter is also CEO of the Jerusalem Biosensor Systems Design, which makes pathogen sensors for Israeli homeland security. Most of the new Israeli uh, vineyards, and, and there really is a kind of buzz around uh, Israeli wine if you look at the, the kind of you know, wine propaganda like the Wine Spectator and these kinds of uh, uh, publications. Uh, most of, of these uh, highly touted new Israeli vineyards uh, could, could uh, readily be called settlement uh, wineries. Meanwhile, most of the farm workers in the occupied territories are undocumented Palestinians, including large numbers of children. In the Jordan Valley, home to almost 20 large agricultural settlements, it is estimated that 10,000 Palestinians work there year-round, and an additional 20,000 work there during the date and grape harvest. Ununionized, Palestinian farm workers labor without protections in dangerous contexts, including exposure to pesticides that have been banned in Europe. And it turns out that about 11% of Palestinian farm workers work on settlement land that originally belonged to their families. Meanwhile, Israeli attacks on Gaza have destroyed or compromised grape growing there, while more broadly, the occupation penalizes all Palestinian agriculture. All of this, keep in mind, is indirectly subsidized by a UC system hostile to BDS. In the remainder of my time, I would like to focus on the first couple of what I call the university agribusiness settler complex, the billionaire San Joaquin Valley corporate farmers Linda and Stuart Resnick. Working alongside Sheldon Adelson, they are influential Zionist uh, philanthropists, and their massive 165 square mile farm in the San Joaquin Valley is one of the world's largest producers of pomegranates, pistachios, and of course almonds. Ironically, while the occupation their donations support has resulted in the destruction of Palestinian farming and the uprooting of olive trees, the Resnicks have dramatically expanded almond production in California. Amidst a severe California drought, their corporation actually uprooted less water-intensive crops to make room for water-intensive almonds, uh, keeping in mind that each almond uh, requires a gallon of water to produce. The Resnicks have also been in the forefront of water speculation in the form of California water banks filled with public water. Similarly, they own Fiji water. Many people in Fiji do not have ready access to clean water, and the Resnick's investments there prop up a brutal military dictatorship. The Resnick's Zionism, moreover, overlaps with their agribusiness interests. As reported by Yasha Levine, they are on the board of trustees of the influential Washington Institute for Near East Policy think tank, which was created as an APAC spinoff in the 1980s. Stuart Resnick is also a board member of the American Friends of IDC, which raises money for the interdisciplinary center Herzla, a think tank with close links to the Israeli intelligence and military establishment. According to Levine, the fact that Resnick is on the board of directors shows his direct involvement in a powerful organization pushing a hardline anti-Iranian policy. After all, Stuart Resnick sits on the board with a long list of well-known neocons, Islamophobes, and Iran war boosters, including Vegas tycoon Sheldon Adelson, the founder of pro-Iraq Iran war group Freedom's Watch, an infamous backer of all things neocon. The Resnicks are hawks on Iran, Levine continues, in part because Iran is their biggest competitor in the global market for pistachios. The Resnicks are also powerful in California politics. They have been major donors for, uh, for California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, and Senator Dianne Feinstein. Schwarzenegger recently loaned his star power to fundraisers for the IDF, while Feinstein's husband and UC regent Richard Blum recently threatened the other regents with political attacks on the UC system by Feinstein if they did not adopt the Department of Justice's definition of anti-Semitism as including criticism of Israel. At the same time, the Resnicks could count on Schwarzenegger and Feinstein to support agribusiness interests. In 2008, for example, after receiving calls from the Resnicks, both politicians supported agribusiness in a drought-fueled ecological dispute over water from the Sacramento-San Joaquin Valley Delta. The Resnicks' political influence extends to the world of universities. 
Stuart Resnick is on the Chancellor's Board of Advisors at UC Davis, where he advises Kati, the University Agribusiness Settler Complex Chancellor. According to the UC Davis website, Resnick is a member of the Executive Board of the UCLA Medical Sciences, member of the Board of Trustees of Bard College, member of the Board of Trustees of the J. Paul Getty Trust, and trustee of the California Institute of Technology, uh, uh, finally a member of the Advisory Board of the Anderson School of Management uh, at UCLA. Uh, the UCLA Law School, which maintains partnerships with Haifa University, Hebrew University, and Tel Aviv University, is also home to the Resnick Program for Food Law and Policy. The success of, of one of uh, the Resnick's most remunerative products, a bottled pomegranate juice called Palm Wonderful, was par has partly depended upon their sponsorship of transnational research at Israeli and California universities. University researchers in Israel and UC Davis, for example, helped make Palm Wonderful possible by inventing a means of using air jets to mechanically extract the seeds from the fruit. The Resnicks have also funded medical research in Israel and at UCLA, claiming to demonstrate the health benefits of pomegranate juice. When such claims were challenged by the FCC, UCLA researchers in Resnick's employ testified in his defense further helping to advertise a product produced in the San Joaquin Valley by low-wage workers of color. According to the company's website, it owns 9,000 acres of pomegranate uh, trees in the valley, making it the largest grower in the United States. Uh, all told, uh, as a UCLA alumni, uh, Resnick and his wife have given a total of 16 million uh, at least to UCLA since, uh, since 2000. Finally, the Resnick's donations have impinged on academic freedom, not only by diverting research at private universities into research that effectively legitimates the occupation and distracts from its violence, but also by their support for privatized research. The aforementioned think tank funded by the Resnick's, the Interdisciplinary Center Herzla, is also a private university in Israel. Many, university, many UC professors guest lecture there, including Bush administration torture apologist and Berkeley law professor John Yu, who joins Alan Dershowitz on the uh, law faculty as a visitor. Meanwhile, the advisory boards of different schools at the university are filled with faculty from the University of California. Among the schools there is the Adelson School of Entrepreneurship, named for super Zionist Sheldon Adelson and dedicated to, quote, promoting Israel's brand as startup nation. One of the school's partners uh, is, uh, of course, the UC Berkeley School of Economics, which participates in a joint student exchange program with them. Um, and uh, you know, in the end, um, uh, I just wanted to emphasize uh, what I was what I was saying about a, a kind of Foucaultian turn when thinking about um, uh, about donors. So, uh, in 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 the last talk by Sandra Hell, uh, we heard uh, uh, really uh, both bracing uh, and disturbing uh, things about the McCarthyism or the McCarthyite atmosphere. Uh, on campus, and that's all incredibly uh, important for us uh, to be thinking about. But I always sort of return to um, to the way in which Foucault had talked about about power, uh, uh, power working not simply by saying no, not simply by silencing or censoring, but also and at the same time often working by inciting, uh, producing, uh, uh, promoting. Uh, and in this case, uh, in the case of um, of, of donors who are who are pushing uh, for uh, investments in higher education uh, that lead to these partnerships between U.S. Ac or the UC system and Israeli uh, academic institutions. I think we also have a, a threat to ac academic freedom of a different sort, which is is funneling uh, uh, money and and research in a direction uh, that is uh, ultimately legitimating uh, the occupation. Okay. Thank you. Manzur Forhur is a history professor at Cal Poly um, uh, San Luis Obispo. Um, she specializes in religion and revolution in Latin America and the Middle East and the connections between the two. Uh, in going through some of her articles, there's one, for example, on Palestinians and Honduras, which I plan to read, um, but has been involved also with the struggle for academic freedom uh, in the Cal State, uh, Cal Poly um, system, and has been active for years in these issues. The, uh, if we look at the Cal State system, this is the largest 
public university system in the United States in the world. We have about 22,000 faculty in the system. We have 23 campuses. So it's important in terms of the numbers and in terms of the number of students that we educate. So academic freedom is a very important issue for us, and we have been pushing for improvement of our policies on academic freedom. Now, when we talk about um, the system, Cal State system, the faculty in Cal State system is represented by two different organizations. One is the Academic uh, Senate of Cal State system, the statewide academic senate, uh, ASCSU, and the other one is the California Faculty Association, which is our union. Now, both of these um, organizations have uh, legal sanctions. They have been legally sanctioned uh, by California law. Uh, the first master plan uh, for California uh, created, which was the Donahue Act in 1960, created the Cal State system. Before that, there were only 16 campuses all independent from each other. The Donahue Camp uh, Act put them together and created a Cal State system. And today, we have 23 campuses. And as I mentioned about, uh, I, I believe we have between 22,000 and 23,000 faculty because the number of lecturers keep changing each year. Uh, now, one of the important things about Donahue Act was that in the same act that created Cal State system, it also referred to shared governance and r role of faculty in running the university. And it was based on that reference that the, um, the statewide Senate uh, began working in 1963 was this first meeting. Before that, each of the campuses had their own Senate. So what happened in 1963 was that all those campus Senates got together and created a statewide Senate. And today, again, we have 23 campuses. Each of them have their own Senate, but each of them sent two or three representatives to the statewide Senate, which we meet every month to look at the academic policy of the whole system. Uh, now, the faculty uh, association, the union, was created a little later based on another uh, piece of legislation, which was the California uh, Higher Education Employer Employee Act, or HERA, in 1978, which created uh, the right for collective bargaining for California State University uh, faculty and all different terms of the employment. Now, CFA, California Faculty Association, was created in 1984 based on that uh, piece of legislation. Now, academic freedom in the California State University is also sanctioned by law. It's not something that administrators have granted to us or anything. Is is the law of California that uh, the public universities uh, respect and promote uh, academic freedom. And by public university, the HERA uh, refers to Cal State system, UC system, and Hastings School of Law. So all of these uh, uh, public slash private universities, they're supposed to respect and promote academic freedom. This is law in California. It's not something granted by the administration. Uh, now, the um, problem with Cal State system is that we do have two different representatives, the union and the academic senate, and they have acted very differently when it comes to academic freedom. Uh, the Constitution of the State of the Academic Senate until very recent, recently did not have any reference to academic freedom. No reference at all in our Constitution. But from its very beginning, 
the senators began taking up the issues related to academic freedom and passing resolutions on academic freedom. And in the beginning, of course, it was not about Israel, Palestine, it was about other issues of academic freedom. But uh, the attacks that, uh, attacks on uh, private rights, on right of privacy, which began with 9-11, uh, basically pushed the state of the academic senate to become much more active in defending academic freedom of the faculty and students. Uh, the, uh, like one of the early resolutions that we passed on this uh, new situation in, uh, in the United States was a resolution in support of the uh, California Library Associations uh, which were trying to um, protect the right to privacy for the people who were using the libraries. Uh, also in 2004, uh, we uh, passed a resolution for the first time in the State of the Academic Senate referring to AAUP 1940 statement and uh, 1970 comments. Uh, now, these were very general resolutions about academic freedom and right to privacy. But then we started hearing from different campuses uh, the uh, particular cases on attack on academic freedom, especially of faculty and students who were involved in activities around the issue of Palestine. So the issues began uh, becoming more particular. For example, in March uh, 2004, on several campuses, including Calice Fresno, the administration began forming new policies, saying that because of the security, the events which are supposedly bringing in controversial speakers have to get uh, permission from uh, campus security which was, of course, a huge problem for academic freedom. So we passed a resolution against that. And then we were attacked on different campuses. Whenever we had any uh, event on Palestine, we were attacked that those um, events were not balanced. So we passed another resolution saying that these are the po policies which are uh, there for stifling academic freedom, and we are opposing those policies. And uh, again, in um, 2004, there was a piece of legislation, uh, SB5, which Senator Morrow uh, brought to California Senate, and it was presented as the Bill of Rights for Students. But basically what it was was that the controversial issues should not be discussed in the classroom. So Academic Senate uh, passed another resolution against uh, this uh, particular piece of legislation, and also some of the senators went all the way to Sacramento and participated in those hearings against uh, this resolution, and that resolution was actually killed in the committee. It never made it to the floor. So that was a big uh, victory for us. Uh, then uh, we had, of course, the uh, U.S. Patriot Act, and we heard from different campuses that some of the local and some of the federal uh, federal government um, organizations had begun um, collecting information on some of the faculty, especially the faculty who were involved in Middle Eastern studies. So we passed another resolution against that. And uh, the, uh, also this resolution asked the administration to protect faculty against those kind of uh, collecting information. So in each step, we were trying to put the administration at notice that we are watching you, and you legally, you have to protect the academic freedom, so do your job or we will come back. And we have been coming back over and over. But anyway, so the another uh, issue that we had, again, like I said, Fresno in 2007, was that the, there was a brand new uh, program on Middle Eastern studies. It was attacked really ugly, in a very ugly way by AMCA and some of other sister organizations at the time, David Horowitz um, kind of people. Um, 
And uh, some of the faculty who were teaching in this uh, program were attacked individually in a very ugly way. Their names, the pictures were published, and they were, uh, of course, uh, accused of being anti-Semitic and all of things that we all know what happens. So that uh, issue was brought to the Civil Academic Senate, and again we passed a resolution against that, those kind of attacks uh, on uh, area studies, and also uh, having the statement saying that this kind of individual attacks on faculty it basically destroys the university environment of uh, approaching academic freedom and free speech. Um, now, of course, the attacks continued. In 2012-2014, we had a series of attacks on different campuses. One of these uh, uh, attacks was on three different campuses, and UCLA was actually involved in this too. We invited Ilan Pape, who had a tour in California going to different campuses and talking about this issue of Palestine. And we were attacked, again the attacks got very, very ugly. <laughs> I remember it was a video uh, was made with the names and the pictures of uh, faculty involved. It was put on the YouTube and they were calling anti-Semitic, a bunch of lies, it was just amazing. But anyway, the good thing was that three campus presidents, uh, uh, the um, Cal State Northridge, uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and Fresno State at the time, they wrote a, a joint statement and very strongly they supported faculty, academic freedom of the faculty. And the academic senate, the civil academic senate, had a resolution endorsing that statement. So made, we made that statement as a document of academic senate. Uh, now, the attacks, of course, continued. At San Jose State, we had another case of a faculty who organized a seminar on uh, teaching Middle East and Palestine. She was attacked. The administration, the local administration, said completely silent. They didn't do anything against the faculty, but they did not defend the faculty either. We had a worse case uh, at San Diego State when, oh my God, I haven't even got to uh, CFA yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, we had a worst case in San Diego State uh, of a lecturer in, um, in an Arabic um, class who had shared a map of the Middle East from the point of view of the Middle Easterners to the class. Of course, Middle Easterners, most of them, they do not recognize Israel. He was attacked. The provost uh, publicly uh, said that that was inaccurate. The California um, Scholars for um, Academic Freedom wrote a letter to the provost uh, and to the president, and other organizations wrote letters. So that faculty, there was no job action taken against the faculty, and the faculty was a lecturer. Uh, he didn't have tenure, but he's still there, he's working, so there was no action taken against him, but the provost never apologized for that statement. Of course, San, uh, San Francisco State, we had the case of uh, Rabab al-Mahdi was attacked because of interview that he, uh, she made in the Middle East. And in that case, the administration opened an investigation on her. Instead of defending her, they opened an investigation of her. Uh, but you know, later, because of the outrage that that action created among the, a lot of academics, uh, the a campus president put a, a statement of defending uh, the professor on the website of the San Diego State. Uh, but uh, the ACL, uh, ASCSU, um, the Civil Academic Senate response was another resolution which was basically deploring and strongly uh, uh, condemning this kind of uh, attacks from outside lobbyist groups and uh, political pressure groups, um, and also in 2011-2012, we started discussing that we have to do something with our constitution. We have been doing all this work on academic freedom, it should get on the constitution. And we finally wrote a resolution, and after a few years, the Board of Trustees approved it, 
And now we have the statement of promoting academic freedom as one of the main responsibilities of the uh, academic senate, state by academic senate. So we are doing fine with the documentation of all of the things that we have to do. Right now, what we are trying to do is trying to, for, to push the board of trustees to change the policy, state by policy that we have uh, on academic freedom. This policy is outdated, it's very limited, it doesn't say anything, and it was passed in 1971 by Board of Trustees. So what we are trying to do is uh, pushing the Board of Trustees to draft a new policy which will have all the new issues, new challenges of academic freedom. Uh, for example, the uh, academic freedom of the faculty beyond the classroom. Uh, the academic freedom of the faculty in terms of electronic communication. Academic freedom of the faculty in terms of, um, let me see, what was the next one? In terms of the social media. That was the case of, of course, Dr. Salita. Uh, the, um, uh, when the faculty criticizes the institution um, as faculty. Uh, so all of this, uh, of course, the constitutional protection of the faculty. So all of these are the uh, points that we are trying to get the Board of Trustees to approve in a new policy on academic freedom for the, uh, for the system. Each of our campuses have their own policies. That's why the local administrators uh, act so differently when it comes to the violation of academic freedom. But we need a really good, a solid policy system wide. And that's what we are trying to do. Now, we have only two minutes, so I get to the f faculty association, the union. Now, the union, in contrast to the academic senate, from the very beginning had a very strong, actually, statement on uh, the uh, protecting academic freedom in its bylaws. So the union was committed to protect uh, academic freedom from the very beginning, but the actions were very different. In the early history, the union was very independent, was very progressive. We had a Peace and Justice Committee, and they were doing a lot of work around academic freedom. But in the 1990s, our union began uh, basically focusing on economic gains for the faculty. It basically became a bread and butter union and left aside all other issues, important issues, which are very important for, um, for faculty. And that Peace and Justice uh, Committee kind of withered away in the 1990s. Uh, but the individual union members, the progressive unions, kept pushing for some of these issues, and they kept bringing in some of the resolutions. Especially, there is a major overlap of membership between the state of academic senate and the union. So some of these members go back and forth, and they were pushing whatever we were doing in the academic senate. They were pushing the union to take it as a model, and some of these resolutions were passed by the, uh, by the union uh, based on the work of the State of Academic Senate. Uh, and also in 2003, a new ad hoc uh, Peace and Justice Committee was formed, and uh, the union also did a lot of solidarity work uh, with other countries. Like we had resolutions about uh, teachers in Mexico, teachers in Colombia, and everything. But when it come to Palestine, it was a completely different story. In 2006, some of the members of the Peace and Justice Committee brought in a resolution requesting that CalPERS, which is the largest pension fund in the world, to, dive, to divest from companies which were involved in um, occupation of Palestine, the, some of the union members began threatening to cancel the membership. The union leadership basically caved in, and they never let that resolution go to the assembly. So that resolution died right there. And also when the ad hoc committee, ad hoc peace and justice committee became the standing committee, the members which were appointed by the leadership by the president, none of the people who were focusing on Palestinian issues 
uh, were appointed to the membership. So we were basically excluded from this. There was another very <laughs> strange case in 2009 uh, during the one month. During the uh, war on Gaza, we brought in another resolution. Uh, the board of the, uh, the committee passed a resolution. The board of the directors revised the resolution, made it so watered down, which basically didn't mean anything. But even that resolution was attacked by some of the Zionist groups and all of a sudden it completely disappeared from the union website. And the union members were kept in dark about that whole internal conversation about this situation. So there were no more attempts to pass any resolution on Palestine, but the, there has been a little bit of hope recently. We had a new elections uh, in last April. We have a new president, and for the first time, our union took a public uh, position against SCR 75, if you remember that. That's uh, a, a bill which is trying to adopt the State Department's definition of anti-Semitism. The union sent a letter to, the, uh, to Senator Stone, who was the author of, the, um, of that um, SCR 7, uh, 35 against that. And also in the hearing, the union took a public position against uh, SCR 70, uh, 74. So there are some hopes. And for that, I really have to thank some of those Zionist groups who have been attacking us. Because those attacks have created this awareness among the faculty, at least in our system, that we need to defend academic freedom. And that's why all the activities. So thank you guys out there. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, 10 minutes uh, for questions. What is happening now, and what can we do to in this room and our other lives, academic and other lives, to support the kinds of connections between the academy, worker rights, and uh, student organizations that are under a lot of fire as well? as well as the transnational issues that Sandra went into. But what, what kinds of actions are going on with, you know, I know our academic senate does not perform real well in terms of supporting student um, repression, I mean, against student repression, but, um, and worker rights, well, you know, we, we all walk out when other people walk out, but, you know, that's about it. It's the usual suspect. And um, so what is going on in the system and in other parts of the world that you know of that show an alliance between the, uh, the defense of academic freedom on campus and its alliance with people who are being repressed in terms of their expression off campus and as students on campus? On, on specifically on the Israeli Palestinian situation, it strikes me that the, the, this business of blurring the lines between Israeli government policy, the Jewish population of Israel, and the Jewish population across the world, of blending these together, the sort of thing like Netanyahu appeared here and said, I speak for all Jews, and J Street and others got a big right. advertisement saying, no, you don't. Uh, but, but it seems to me that, that in fact, this is a, obviously, I think, I'm close to agree, a very intentional policy on the part of the supporters of the Israeli government to blur that line so that when you, when you attack the policy of the government, it's considered an anti Semitism. The State Department, even the State Department, I think, however, you, 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 you can still parse that through it. My question is what is being done really to make that point clear on the campuses to sort of, to, towards the division? between these three things, that, you know, that the Israeli government is not the Israeli people, even the Jewish population, and the Jewish population of Israel is really not the international population, and to force them to be educated around that separation. I'd just be curious as to where one could find the uh, resolution on Gaza um, from 2009. I ask this because I teach at a private university, and we are actually represented by the American Federation of Teachers, which in uh, 2006, uh, became the only union in the world to uh, endorse Israel's uh, invasion of Lebanon. 
and uh, in language that was just totally um, over the top, factually inaccurate, and on a whole number of levels. Uh, they, they denied any efforts of amendment or an alternative resolution, even one that would defend Israel's right of self-defense, uh, but also would condemn the killing of civilians and, and correctly uh, an accurate language. And I would love to see a copy of that, just to contrast uh, what, 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 what uh, the, the, the public union <laughs> did and, and what the or what the English California union did and what the AFT did. Well, let me respond to Christine's uh, question first. Um, well, I think we do what we're doing right now, which many of us are trying to link up um, other countries, their unions, their student movements. I think the students are doing a much better job of these links than, than, than we are. Um, but also the, the intellectual and academic kinds of links that Curtis just made just blew my mind. Um, and it's not an approach that I had thought about before. I mean, I've not, I've not read your work. Um, and for us to try to, um, t especially to get at the donors uh, at the University of California and at Cal State and the Cal State system, I think would be very, very important and do exactly what you're doing, which is to show the um, where they serve on the boards, various boards, um, and and put that side by side with a number of their public statements and so on. I think it would be very effective. Um, that's all I want to say right now because I don't want to take much time. I, I think we are trying to um, n make these distinctions. We may not be doing a very good job of it, but I don't know how many times those of us supporting the academic boycott have said this is not an individual boycott. And people still choose, in fact, I guess, to misunderstand that. Um, and, and, you know, so we keep laboring on the same point just to, just to pick one of them. But I think we could do a better job. And we also are sloppy sometimes in the way in which we use the terminology. We slip and slide um, among the various terms like Zionism and, and, and Jewish communities and, um, and uh, Israel and Israeli policies. I mean, we're, we're careless often. And I think we need to tighten up our language, um, all, all of us actually, tighten up our language. I'm amazed when I look at the things that I wrote even three or four years ago, how sloppy I was in, in, in blurring these distinctions myself. Um, so that's you know, all that I have to say right now to, to that. I, w I would just add I'm really kind of uh, interested, at, at, at least on my campus and, and in other UC campuses, on uh, the move among uh, graduate student uh, TA unions. Uh, to, to, to support BDS. And that's coming, you know, kind of unusually, it's coming out, out of a context in which you know, I think that aren't the TAs, their, their, their national union is the United Auto Workers, so that's just uh, amazing, but I don't think, it, it, I don't think it's going to be unusual, as unusual in the future. So what we're really seeing is that the Labor Council in Greater San Diego, um, there's some of these kinds of old-fashioned uh, dinosaur labor types that, um, that are very bread and butter and are very focused on trade union stuff and uh, but there's a whole other group of activists, many of them uh, of color, who are invested in the prison industrial complex, in uh, maquiladoras, um, and I think it's just a matter of time before we see those kinds of connections happening with at least some forms of organized labor. Uh, well, I just want to talk about that resolution and the union. Uh, right now, I'm not active in the union that much. I left after that, uh, what happened to that resolution. But, uh, uh, and I have been very active in the academic senate, and we have done a lot in the academic senate, but I believe that the uh, focus should be the union. The union has m many more members, it has much more resources to, uh, uh, to reach people, and has a much stronger voice. Now, what happened to that resolution was that the original resolution basically talked about um, what was happening in Gaza, especially attack on educational institutions, because we as an educational union 
we always talk about the educational issues in other countries. As I said, we have resolution about Colombia, about Mexico and everything. So we started from that point that that war is not only destroying Gaza, but especially educational uh, institution, which is our job to defend, and also the usage of white phosphorus and other chemicals in Gaza. And then we uh, connected that, because that was also at the time of budget crisis in California. So we connected it to the budget crisis, saying that the United States is supporting this and the money should come back to the United States for our issues, social issues, especially education. So the connection between education and the union work, everything was there. Then when we went uh, to the board of uh, directors, they took out all the um, references to occupation. They took out references from, about uh, U.S. support of Israel. Everything was out. So the final version of that resolution uh, was uh, something that uh, this war is bad because it's killing civilians from both sides. So basically equating the, uh, the Palestinians with the Israelis in this whole thing. That's why when the uh, resolution was finally adopted by the board of directors, I personally I voted against it. I, I just couldn't stand that kind of resolution. But even that resolution, if did not go to the website on the board of direct, directors website, it went to the uh, Peace and Justice uh, Committee's website. I was there until a few years, uh, a few years ago when some Edelman and uh, there's this organization, Middle East Schol Scholars for Peace, which is basically a part of Israel lobby. They attacked uh, the union, and they wrote a uh, letter to the union leadership saying that if you do not uh, pull this resolution, if you do not cancel this whole uh, issue, uh, we are going to write a public uh, a letter and ask all the Jewish uh, members of the union to cancel their membership. At that point, I was still in the uh, email list of the union activists. I got that, and there was some back and forth um, discussion about that. And all of a sudden, I was dropped off that member, uh, of, off that uh, email list. So I never know what happened to that uh, conversation. The only thing I know that uh, we asked for uh, of the union to defend us it did not happen and that resolution disappeared completely so if you want um, a copy of that I will ask people in the union maybe we can find a copy of that somewhere but, but again that's not the kind of resolution that I would publicize at all as a good work of, of a union <laughs>